Welcome to another episode of Parallax. My name is Angshman Chaudhary and I work with the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies. Today we have with us Kinza Wynn, um, who is the director of Tampadipa Institute at Yangon in Myanmar. He's also a very close observer of uh, politics in Myanmar uh, and has written extensively on recent uh, developments. Today I have Wynn with me to discuss the upcoming elections in Myanmar. Um, Myanmar is slated to go for national polls on the 8th of November. And these are very historic elections in many ways uh, for Myanmar, because this is the first election that will be held under completely civilian administration. The last elections uh, that were held in 2015, which brought the National League for Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi to power, was held under a quasi civilian um, was held under quasi civilian administration so in many ways this is a this is a, a historic moment for myanmar but a lot has happened since 2015 uh, both within the boundaries of myanmar and both outside that have directly affected popular sentiments and political dynamics within myanmar and i'm hoping win can help us make sense of some of those uh, welcome uh, uh, win and thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. My pleasure. Win, I'm just going to begin with a very broad question here, uh, which is, uh, in many ways, Myanmar's democratic transition, which began in 2015, has received a lot of global attention, and a lot has a lot has happened um, within Myanmar, as I said, in the last five years, uh, in the, the last five odd years, which have, which have affected public sentiments in many ways, which have affected the political formations and the political equations in many ways, if I may. What, according to you, do these elections mean in the broader context of Myanmar's democratic transition? Okay, that's a very good question, because um, what we are looking at now is not just about um, a change of political parties or one party winning uh, the elections is also about the future of Myanmar's democracy, you know, and to make sure that Myanmar's return to democracy is really sound. Uh, I have to remind people that Myanmar had democracy in the past. We had a, a hiatus of half a century when we were under a military regime dictatorship. There's not been a revival of democracy, but we want to make it on a proper footing, that's more important. You know? not, it's not just this party winning or that party winning and you know, whatever. So what I mean to really say is that a lot hinges upon this election, even more than in 2015. We know that in 2010 and 2015, which party was going to win. You know? Now this time, um, it's going to be a little, little bit tighter. You know? And at the same time, a lot, as I've said, is hanging in the balance. I think one of the defining features of uh, Myanmar's democratic transition and something that has also been talked about a lot uh, is the civil military dynamic. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost as if uh, the entire transition has hinged on that and how, how this relationship has shaped up in the last five years. Yes. <laughs> how, how do you see that dynamic play out in this elections or in the wake of these elections? Yeah, that's also an important question. Now, for a long time, it was a stark black and, black and white, you know? You see uh, democratic forces versus the military dictatorship and um, who will get the better of it. But especially in the past five years in this term, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of nuances in this equation, as you say, you know. In some ways, the civil military relation has become closer. For instance, between, especially between the it is still as before, you see. So it's a little bit complex, but here in this election, we find that on, on many aspects, in many sectors, the military and the NLD are together. It may surprise you, you know, 
and that accounts for a lot of things. Just to give one example, Myanmar is facing a case at the International Court of Justice brought by the Gambia. It's now been joined by the Netherlands and um, uh, the Canada for its atrocities amounting to genocide against the Rohingya. Aung San Suu Kyi went there to defend the military. So on, in a case like this, they are hand in a glove. You know? A lot of people don't like it, but people say that it's just a fact of life. The military, especially the ethnic minorities, don't like it. And at the same time, the war has been ended. You know? The peace process is almost hollow. You know? And uh, here too, we find that in many ways, especially in the, five year, in the past five years, the military and Aung San Suu Kyi are on the same page when it comes to uh, federalism, when it comes to relations with the ethnic minorities. So you can't just the different whites, you see? So in a way, how will it play out? We're not talking about um, the military's relation with just one particular political political party, the NLD. We want to see how the military will relate, relate to the general public, especially the ethnic minorities to which, with whom they've been at war for 70 years. See? So a lot of things will come out in this, in this election. Uh, the commander in chief is due to retire soon. You see, you do, you do, we don't know exactly when. There will be a change in the military. And um, what is its future going to be? At the same time, don't forget, people try to downplay this. The case at the International Court of Justice still goes on. You know? And uh, if it really amounts to genocide, it takes a long time. I mean, a lot of people's futures are in the balance. Uh, when, what, what do you think are the key issues uh, that people care about or voters care about in these elections? And do you think there is some you know, at least some level of congruence between what people care about and what the parties in the fray are delivering or are promising to deliver. At this time, I want everybody to understand that it's not a matter of mere restoration of democracy, uh, that, that democracy is being obstructed by the military, and so we have to remove the military and have a full democracy. That is almost passe, you know, and it has um, come down in priority. Now, let's face it, what people are worried about now is the pandemic and the economic troubles that accompany it. You know? I hear that there have been a lot of suicides and people are sometimes um, eating rats and all that. And um, the government hasn't really handled it well. So that is one big issue for the most, most, most of the people. At the same time, you remember, must remember, our civil war has not really ended. There's still fighting in Rakhine fighting in Shan State, you know, and attention state. Elections have been cancelled in 22 constituencies, well, all of them ethnic, you see. So a lot of things are people, are foremost in people's minds, they're worried about that, you know. And um, what, what, what about education? Schools have been closed, you know. Uh, and the high cost of health care, you know? And um, when is transport going to be restored? You know? I don't think the government has really drawn up a program, you know, for what they call post-pandemic economic recovery and where the money is going to come from. And that's, that's where the international donors and investments come in, you see? But for the moment, the people are also paying a lot of attention to the elections, you know? uh, especially, I mean, I would, I would say everywhere, all over the country. And I think um, despite the risk of the pandemic, so at, at the moment, people want to really express themselves. Well, the NLD still has um, um, a core of loyalists and they hope that they will win again with the landslide. Aung San Suu Kyi was saying openly that she wants a landslide. You know, it's kind of rich, isn't it? And the ethnics, especially, they have really been 
let's say, pissed off you know, by the NLD and, and the and, and Aung San And so they are making a concerted effort to win seats in the election. They are even saying that we are going to form a coalition so that we can form a government. Well, there are, these, are, these are historic facts for Burma. You know? We've been an independent nation for 70 years. And all along, the ethnic nationalities have gone along with the mainstream. This time, this year, they are breaking off. And there are some um, four or five national parties uh, with close to the uh, military who have emerged, and they've been contesting a lot of seats. So it will be, despite the pandemic and the limitations on, um, on campaigning, I think it will be a closely fought and interesting um, election to watch. Right. It's, it's very interesting how COVID-19 has become an election issue uh, in so many elections yes. around the world, not just yes. in Myanmar, even the United States. Um, COVID has mm -hmm. suddenly climbed to the top of the uh, agenda, mm -hmm. um, especially after President Donald Trump uh, got the virus. But you, you talked about a very important point, which is the uh, dynamic of the ethnic parties or how the ethnic parties approach uh, politics in Myanmar. And in many ways, since since decades now uh, this this tension sort of between ethnic parties and the bamar parties uh, including the nld has mm -hmm. has been a defining trait of myanmar's political landscape right uh, we saw how how poorly the ethnic parties uh, fared in the last elections in 2015 um, and many analysts at that sat, at the time said that it, it happened because there were so many ethnic parties trying to uh, independently uh, win the elections, which led to a lot of vote splitting. You know, in fact, yes. if I if I correctly remember, uh, the ethnic parties fared much better in the 2010 elections uh, compared to the 2015 yes. elections. Yes. yes, uh, yes. My, yes. but this time, as you said, uh, they have formed certain alliances, right? Uh, if I'm yes. not if I'm not wrong, um, the UNA, one of the alliances. Yeah, United Nationalities Alliance has formed the United Nationalities Democracy Party. Uh, another alliance, NBF, has formed the Federal Union Party. So what we see this time essentially is these uh, ethnic parties coming together and hedging their bets collectively rather than mm -hmm. se separately. Yeah. How do you think uh, is this going to play out? Is this bad news for NLD uh, or, or is NLD still going to come out uh, as the single largest party, in a sense. Uh, let me first say that it's almost a reversion to colonial rule, British rule. You know? The British um, governed Burma, ruled Burma separately. You know? There was British Burma, which was the, the heartland, the central, and there was the mountainous periphery where it allowed um, let's say, uh, traditional modes of um, governance to uh, continue, like the Maharajas in India, the Shan Sobas, like the Chin Duas, you know, the Chin Chiefs. So Burma was governed, let's say, they called it a diarchy, no, not the diarchy, in two separate formats. You know? And now we are seeing the same thing. Uh, the Burman leaderships, especially Aung San Suu Kyi's main failing, has been not being able to bring the two, let's say, communities, the two co components, the two segments of the population together. You know? And to say, one of the prime reasons for this 70 year old war is the ethnic's desire, you know for more autonomy. And they've continued, the centers continue to deny them, including Aung San Suu Kyi, I repeat again and again. You know? uh, the answers that you mentioned just now, the UNA and the NBF, they are the new ones now. You know, a lot of time has passed over that. So this time, now in 2015, one of the reasons for the ethics doing badly is that many ethnic nationalities voted for the NLD as well. Because 
The main focus then was to unseat the military. People hated the military. They still do for all the atrocities they committed, for all the killings, you know, and the lootings and the rapes. So the ethnics who have borne the brunt of it thought that the best way to unseat the military is to vote for the NLD. But it was very naive, of course, you see. Um, even even the, the diaspora abroad. Well, I was told that they've been phoning their relatives here in in Burma, saying them to vote NLD in 2015. Well, all that is past now. See, and they have realized the hard way, the bitter way that they have to stand on their own feet. They can't rely on Aung San Suu Kyi to do that for them. See? Uh, you would even say that Aung San Suu Kyi has done an about face on how what unity means and what, what inter-ethnic relations mean. See? But at the same time, you have to keep in mind that the United Union Elections Commission is not an in independent nonpartisan body. Just last week, you know, they canceled elections in Rakhine and Shan State, Basel Kitchen, and in Tien. In all the ethnic states, especially the two states, Shan and Rakhine, where the NLD lost. See, so this is sleight of hand, let me say. Let me let me tell you, you know. Uh, resulting sh sharp methods, to be polite, you know, resulting sharp methods, sleight of hand. And um, yesterday they said they were going to um, reconsider. Uh, some village tracks um, will be, uh, elections will be held and all that. You see. So it's hard to um, believe that this party is, and that this commission is acting independently, properly, you know, sensibly, you know. So we see institutions being corrupted and being co-opted also by the main ruling party. Okay, that's what it's, they, they've been done. I think the central lesson of this year, 2020, before the elections, is that there can be ethnic parties and the ethnic armed organizations are going their own way. I wouldn't say uh, succeeding, although the American army is talking about uh, succeeding and, and, and forming a confederation. I think next election will be a milestone in Burma's history, a landmark, because the ethnics will be going their own way. So I personally, I would applaud it, you know, because we have, we've had this Burma dominance for so long, and it has turned out badly, not only for the ethnics, but also for the Burma majority. You know, look at the um, dominance, the impunity that the military enjoys. You see? So we hope that, although I said it's a, it's a milestone, we hope that it'll be steady, you know, and um, it will not um, throw the country off balance, although there, there, there are worries. The thing is, if there is conflict, if there's fighting, you must substitute political dialogue. And one of the best ways is to have ethnic people elect their own people, elect their own parties into parliament. The NLD is not allowing that to happen. You know, I think it's a major blunder for any country. You know, so, so, so they're, they're trying to say that you are a conquered people. You know, you have to submit to us, and uh, it's just not going to work. You talked about um, the ethnic parties, and in that context, actually. I wanted to uh, talk about the co constitution amendment process uh, mm -hmm. that the NLD had initiated last year, in fact, and um, which and un unsuccessfully so. Uh, it was completed. <laughs> it was completed earlier this year. But the main articles that NLD uh, set out to amend in the 2008 military drafted constitutions, they actually did not pass uh, the House because. Um, um, it was, they were effectively vetoed down uh, by the military in the parliament. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is that, is, is this an issue, this election? Do people care about uh, constitutional amendments? And uh, that the process that we saw earlier this year, the NLD's attempt to amend the constitution, is that somehow going to factor uh, in these elections? 
the simple answer to that is no. no. Um, I would even say that the NLD was not sincere about the amendments. It had been one of the campaign promises in 2015, so they had to follow through, through it. They knew it was not going to work. So they just went through the motions of it to satisfy some people. And um, they were surprised when it was detailed. All right. Now, for this election, like I said, we will have other worries. Constitutional amendments is not so much an issue now, you know, because there are certain things that you can do under the present constitution, which the NLD has not done. I'll give you a very good example. It can be done by the president, but the NLD president has not done it. And that is the appointment of chief ministers. Yeah. You don't have to amend the constitution for that, you know, because the president gets to appoint the chief ministers. You know? He could have appointed at least two or three from the ethnic parties, you know? and he didn't. All the 14 chief ministers are NLD. Some of them were, well, dead, you know, and three have been removed. One is in jail because of corruption. And this is something that is not, you don't have to amend the constitution to get it done. Now, so that is going to be one big issue after the elections, because there could be some states where the opposition parties win the majority. It's a little difficult, you know, but, and, and they're going to say that we, why, why can't we get the chance to appoint our own chief minister? The Rakhine did in 2015, and Aung San Suu Kyi flatly turned them down, you know? It wasn't in the news um, so much, you know? But the Arakanese, the Rakhines, are very bitter about it. And this time, well, it's flat. Even before the elections, nine out of 17 constituencies and townships in Rakhine are not going to have elections. A, a, million, a million people are disenfranchised at, at, at the minimum. So uh, I would say nobody's really, um, you look at realistically, nobody's really uh, expecting the military to bow out of politics to give up their seats in Parliament. You know? And if they just be looking at the end of these track record, what, what will they do? You know? I think uh, there's even some talk that in the next uh, government, the Ministry of Home Affairs, which is under a general now, you know, a military general now, will revert to civilian rule. You see? Will be Okay, let's ask an honest question. Will the civilian NLD government be able to cope with it? It's a big, it's a big um, let's say, transformation. It's a big change. So going back to your question, well, the main issues um, in the Constitution that need amending, you know, have been talked over for, for long, you know, and they've been well, debated in Parliament. I don't think we are coming to see any end of it soon and any res resolution of it. You know? Now, so we, do, we talk about federalism, like appointing the um, ethnic people, politicians as chief ministers. If you are really keen, and if you're really sincere about starting the federal process, it can go step by step, you know. I tell people, why do you have to wait for federalism to be enacted and brought on, um, onto your lap? You can go step by step and do that. And appointing chief ministers is, is a, one of the first steps that you can do. You know? It doesn't have to be, uh, change the um, constitution wholesale to allow federalism. See? But we now know, it's clear now, that the military is not really keen on that. NLD is even opposed to it, you know? So that is part of the 
bitter lesson that the ethnic minorities have had to learn. So again, yeah. if you ask, is constitutional amendment going to be an issue, I would say no. Right. And what about the you know, uh, ethnic peace process or uh, the quote unquote national reconciliation process? Uh, because in many ways, the NLD has almost projected the process as its as its flagship project, almost as its success yes, story. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, over the past mm -hmm. five years. We have seen uh, four Union Peace Conferences or 21st Century Panglong yes. Conferences being held. So in many mm -hmm. ways, there has been some level of progress. Uh, but do you think, how do you think the voters see the peace process? Uh, do, you, do, you, do, you act, do they actually see it as a success story uh, for the NLD government? Or do you think uh, there is still lack of public faith uh, within the national reconciliation process? That's a very important question for Burma too. Now, even people who are very favorable to Aung San Suu Kyi say that she should not give, have chosen um, to give the peace process such high priority. There are people who were saying two, three years ago that, oh, she's neglecting economic development and pouring all her attention onto the, on the peace process. They say that she should not have done that. She should at least allow um, some attention, but not the whole state attention. Now, what has happened now with Aung San Suu Kyi is that she put too much of her eggs into the peace basket, you know, and it didn't work out. So, well, people don't like to say this, of course, and people don't like to admit it, but the peace process, let's say, has not met with success at all. You see? It's just hanging on to tenuously, you see? I don't mean all the expense of the big conferences that they held, they're getting some donor money, but the time lost, very important. Yeah? Five years have been lost, and the trust and the faith that have been lost, and the confidence that has been lost. And now we have a kind of warlord situation where the ethnic armed organizations are fighting the military, the ceasefires break down. You know? They put so much faith and credibility in the uh, what they call the NCA, the Nationwide Ceasefire Arrangement. 15 uh, groups have signed it. But now we have the RCS, which is a Shana group. It has signed the ceasefire and now it's fighting the military. Or the military is fighting them. You see? So it's very hollow. It's almost like a sham, you see? And um, where is this, this going to lead to? Now, as I've said, on the political front, the ethnic nationalities are forming mergers and coalitions and going their own way. The ethnic armed organizations will also take the cue from there, saying that, hey, we can't sign any ceasefire, we can't lay down our arms. You know, you know what these people are. What is their assurance? You see? And um, there will be less and less faith in. And the the uh, acronym and I think um, there's a big fund known as a joint peace fund which is due to end next year. I don't think donors will come up with uh, new money. So we have to revamp it, and that is another reason we need new blood, new faces, and new young people, younger people, you know, in Parliament. I have much more faith in the parliament and the executive or the judiciary. Let me be plain on that, you know? And Myanmar's problem, one of the biggest issues in Myanmar politics is also one of age cohorts, you know? And of people in their seventies are hanging on to power and not, not only not giving way to younger people, not grooming, a younger set of people, you see. Are we going to have, you know, politics um, run by 70 year olds forever? Well, they said this long ago about Jamal Dukal, you know, calling him grandpa and all that, yeah. 
And the same thing is happening. Well, in Asian societies, uh, people uh, put a lot of um, uh, credence on age you know, and a lot of respect given to older people more than in the West. But MI is being taken to an extreme. And look at the NLV sensor. So there has to be, well, even naturally, um, a transformation to uh, uh, um, younger age groups, younger cohorts. You know? um, it's, like, it's like hoping that well, every, everything else has failed. We have to depend on the younger people, uh, on the younger generation, for fresh ideas, for energy, for a new way of looking at things. You know? There was a 20, 26 year old, a chin who talked about the five four party alliance, you know, and she said, we are willing to go into coalition with all parties, whether they are from the Bama area or from, from, from ethnics. You know? well, that is what we need, you know, a new way of looking at things. You, you can just lay ethnicity and religion aside. We, we, we just have to say that, okay, sorry, but the elder generation has failed. Please give us a chance. You know, we have less of your hang-ups. We have less discrimination. We have less barriers, and that's I think is where the um, next impetus, the next step, is going to come from. Well, we've lost so much time. You know, what can we do? And like I was telling you, almost half of my work is now to groom the next generation. You see. To bring them, to bring them up, to train them, you know, to to make them aware of the big issues of the day, and it happens every day. It's very sad, but um, well, let's hope that this will be the last election that the older generation tries to dominate. You know, well, let's be frank. Our son is seventy-five. She'll be 80 in the next elections. Is she going to stand for election again? Even in her own party, forget about the parliament and other parties. Yeah? Even in her own party, she is not grooming a new generation. So all these, well, of course, it's like taking the very long view. Well, things like peace, federalism, the peace process, they failed. Yeah? Another, another, components which we, we have to, another issue which we have to mention is the presence of women. Well, this uh, time around in these elections, we are having a slightly higher percentage younger women coming up, and I applaud it too, you see. Well, women have been shut out for, for, for long, you know, and that has to change too. Right. It's, um, it's, it's, it's actually, uh, not surprising that there is a reluctance from the old guard to pass the beat into the to the new guard because uh, this is almost uh, I would say a universal trait across uh, Asi Asian polities, um, including mm -hmm. here in mm -hmm. India. Uh, Japan, yeah, look at that. Mm -hmm. There is a there is there is always uh, this reticence uh, from the old political elite to trust even trust the new generation. It's, there is mm -hmm. always, always this sort of gap between both. Uh, but I'm glad you talked about the gender representation bit. I think um, that's very crucial. And this time we have seen significantly more percentage of women candidates um, yes, yes, yes. Um, in the elections. But what I now want to talk about is what you, you have spoken about in your answers uh, briefly. is the cancellation of the elections uh, in certain areas. Uh, recently, we saw the Union Election Commission uh, cancel po polling in certain areas. Um, and a lot of those areas were ethnic minority areas. Um, yes. And the official official re reason that was given um, were would be essentially two reasons, which is security and COVID nineteen, right? Yes. But uh, the decision wasn't well received by many, uh, particularly the ethnic parties, who felt uh, that it was a politically motivated decision by the UAC, which is supposed to be an independent body. Um, and uh, there was even a joint statement by five ethnic parties, a very harshly worded yes. joint statement by five yes. ethnic parties. Yes. 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 So um, 
how do you see these cancellations? Do you, do you do you do believe that uh, there is some sort of uh, surreptitious political motivations between uh, behind this decision by the UAC, or do you think this is just a standard protocol? No, it's not standard. No, um, of course um, they would be very quick to deny it. You know that it is if it had been politically motivated. You know. Um, they bow to political pressure, but that's just it. You know? It's hard to pin down, but that is it. You see, um, returning to a more democratic ambience means that we have commissions, uh, even the Supreme Court and um, the Anti-Corruption Commission, Elections Commissions, you know, like that. They're supposed to be independent. Even the Peace Center, during the last administration, it was supposed to be independent, but it was not. Especially this Elections Commission. They're all men, and um, they are more or less, let's say, let's face it, appointees of the NLD and the Supreme Court, too. You know, look what Trump is doing in, with the American US Supreme Court. They are facts. As the um, word goes, a new government will always pack these institutions and courts with their own people, with their own loyalists, to make sure that their way of doing things gets done. And that is happening with the NLD, with the UEC. See? People, well, most of them don't have very illustrious uh, records, you know, whatever, whatever they are. And uh, a lot of yes men, a lot of people, if all, all okay, I forgot to mention the Human Rights Commission too. It's the same, the same situation. Um, the chairman of each commission gets minister, minister, minister rank. The commissioners are deputy minister rank with all the perks. People love that, I'm sorry to say. You know, you get a car, you get a chauffeur, you get a nice house, you get a good salary. That's all, and they always say yes. You see, they all hate me for saying these things, but that is true in Myanmar politics. And so it's like sometimes the leader does not have to issue explicit instructions. The people around her, the courtiers, and those people that I just mentioned, they make it, they make sure that the NLD will win. And there are ways of doing it, and that's what they're doing. Now, very important point, I have to bring this up uh, here as well. The UN Election Commission, when it was being lambasted for what it did, said that, oh, it's not our decision alone. The Defense Ministry has to rule the Home Ministry has rule on it. All right, fine, fair enough. Hey, remember, the military has been very reticent about it. Not a single word has come from the military about this. All right, so they rule that, well, these 22 constituencies, you know, in so many states, the elections are canceled. Just the other day, a few days ago, due to pressure from all many quarters, the elections, Union Elections Commission backtracks. They made a U-turn, and in Rakhine and Shin, they removed certain village tracks. We call them village tracks from the cancel lists. Okay, who decided? You know, did the military decide? Did the police decide? You no, know, and or did the UEC slash NLD decide on its own? We are we still in the talk about this. You know? that, that's the thing. So, well, well, the upshot is that um, we are not going to have elections in very critical constituencies where the opposition is strong. You see, there is one entire constituency, um, entire township in north central Shan State by the name of Bankai. You see? There's no fighting going on there. 
the people that say that it's safe, it's even more safer than Yangon. They say that if we are, <laughs> if elections are um, canceled in our township, elections have to be canceled in Yangon too, because there's so much COVID pandemic um, um, raging in, in Yangon. Well, that's it. So that's the thing. Um, that bank guy is a surefire shot for the Shan party. And the NLD was bound to lose. So what, what did they do? We cancel it. Yeah. I don't want to use this word. I'm really hesitant, but I have to use it. It's called dirty tricks. Yeah. And then um, because of this, the UEC gets lambasted, severely criticized for that. But the ethnic parties and all the, those people that are associated with it are, are getting very incensed, you know, very resentful, very bitter. You know? There have been some speeches made recently um, also saying that um, going back to the past, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi made sure that 17 Muslims from the NLD were shunted aside. You know, all these um, skeletons in the, in, the, in the cupboard are coming rattling out. See? And very soon there could be lead to personal attacks. We don't want to, to see that thing going on. But by doing all this, and um, if you add it all together, it means that the semblance of unity, I don't want, even want to use the word unity among the ethnics, um, the, the sense of cohesion between the Burma and the ethnic nationalities, you know, is weakening. Weakening. Okay? And they suffered for, for so long. They really had uh, faith in Aung San Suu Kyi when she began, you know, because of her father's name and all that. The years have seen a steady de de decline in that. You know? It's almost um, uh, ugly to see that all their hope is being dashed now. And on, on top of that, fighting is still going on, you know, economic development is not happening. So there's a um, widening of the differences of the, of the gaps between the Burma and the non burma I wrote a, an article today and there's published by published, uh, saying that this election is going to accelerate ethnic divisions. And I know, well, and to put it together, I don't think the NT is not, is patently incapable of doing that, huh? whether Aung San Suu Kyi is alive or not. You see? So again, it's up to other hands, you know, other hearts, other people, other personalities to do it. But it has to be done. And the Baba, Baba, Baba have to do it as well. It's like the Burma acting as a um, cohort. You know? um, but maybe it's peer pressure. I don't think there are Burma politicians who have stood up to say these unpopular things. Even the, the new national parties that have emerged this time, they are being very tight-lipped about this. No, nobody talks about the Ranger, for instance. See? So you go along with the crowd, see? And it's also a matter of charisma. People don't like the NLD, so they'll vote for us. We don't see anything new in party agendas and party platform, and, um, much less a new vision for the country. And, that, I think, is something that we have to really apply ourselves. We have more, well, of course, when the pandemic goes, um, have seminars and conferences on these issues, things like even like national identity and how we are going to bring it together again. Right. One of the last things that I want to come to, actually, is, is something that that you know has become integral to the 
uh, discourse on Myanmar, if I may, across the world. And it's something that uh, one cannot talk about Myanmar without talking about this, which is Rakhine State. Um, since the NLD came yes, to power yes, in, in 2015, a lot has happened in Rakhine State and a lot is happening currently. Um, first, the Rohingya crisis That's began uh, around October 2016. It aggravated in October 2017. Um, and then we saw the uh, yes, mass- yes. massive outflux Ooh. of uh, close to 800,000 Rohingya refugees. To Starting in August. Yes. Um, so it drew it drew a lot of uh, international attention, and I would say negative international attention uh, for the NLD and for both the NLD and the military. What I want to understand from you mm-hmm. is yes. how does the country or the majority, at least the majority Bamar constituencies within the country, uh, look at the Rohingya issue? Is it, is, it any, uh, is it a major factor? Is it going to be a major factor in the elections? Or is it something that uh, has been pushed to the margins of the public discourse? Yeah. The thing is, um, yeah, the people the way people view the Rohingyas, and that's the, that's the main point. Well, there has been a certain change in that, and that is a ray of hope that we need to build upon. That's very important of the fighting with the American army. American is uh, what is very closely related to the Burmese. But now they are in active combat you know, with, with heavy losses on both sides and a lot of civilian deaths. Because of that, the Aragon, Buddhist Arakanese, Rakhines, and the Rohingya have come closer, have drawn closer, have come to an understanding, which is like a turning things upside down. And previously, we thought that the Rakhines were the People who there's been a change. One of the little recognized events of this year is that, and there's a statement by the Rangers that we sympathize with the Rohingyas who are being. Uh, um, suppressed by the Burmese army. And the Arakan army was saying that we want an Arakan where everyone can coexist. Yeah? And there were uh, Rakhine student unionists who went to the refugee camps and talked to the Muslims. Two years ago, that would not, not have been possible. So we see the beginnings of a rapprochement between the two communities. And the UN didn't do it. Even if a civil society to do, do it, wonder of wonders is because of the war that people that drew people together. It's like, okay, this is a ray of hope for people like me, for me activists, young and old, who are working, working on this together to build a new understanding between communities that have, that have been separated and divided for so long. This is a ray of hope, perhaps the only glimmer of hope that we have. And we have to build on that. Uh, when my last question, uh, I think this is something I had to ask. Do you think the COVID-19 situation will affect uh, voter turnout uh, uh, in the elections? Uh, because we see that the caseload in Yangon, for instance, yes, extent, yes. Um, that it's, it's significantly yes. high. It's not low. And there, there is a considerable uh, public health risk. And there have been talks about yes. this. That the, uh, that the elections need to be postponed because, you know, uh, p- people won't turn up, just won't turn up at the ballot box to vote. So do you think the COVID yes, situation yes. is going to significantly affect the uh, voting process? Yes, in Yangon. Yangon. Definitely. Definitely. Other parts of Burma, quite, quite okay. Now, again, I don't want to always paint the dark picture, bleak picture, but she's obsessed with winning the elections. She doesn't care about COVID, see? And so she's 
doing every means that she can to make people turn up for elections. Yeah. That's a major worry that the vote turnout would mean to come in and vote, and that means less votes for her. But in Yango, well, let's just move to the um, health side. People are really worried about COVID, and so there will be people who will stay away. And so we have only two weeks left. And what is the health department going to say? Is it safe or we are going there with um, masks and social distancing? And are we going to have more uh, polling stations and all that? Well, what are the arrangements that have been made? If the health department and the um, local authorities can cooperate, we can have a situation on election day which will reassure people. It, ha it just can't be whitewashed. It has to be really credible. And, and if the overburdened health departments and the volunteers, very important, and uh, not so efficient local authorities can really come together and tell the public it's safe for you to come, people will come. See? Well, people like me, we, 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 we vote, I don't care very much. But there are people in Yango who are going to think twice about going there. People are, there are people who say that no matter what, I'm not going to vote. See? And so it will take a major effort. I, I don't think the NLD is devoting much attention to it. It's just says that, ah, okay, even if Yango doesn't vote for us, uh, we have plenty of uh, supporters elsewhere. They don't really care much about that. But I would say that Yangon is a major city, and um, how Yangon votes um, will have a lot of um, say in the outcome of elections. Um, opposition parties, the many um, parties contesting in Yangon, can capitalize on this, saying that, okay, look what the NLD has done for you, you know, or what the NLD has not been doing for you. There is COVID, but Rest assured, we will handle it if you vote for us. And that could be a draw. Now, one final thing <clears throat> is the COVID vaccine. No? There was a high level um, Indian delegation who came two weeks ago. And one of the things that they uh, agreed upon is that India and Myanmar will jointly develop a COVID vaccine. And India will help us. See? We know there are limitations. Now, India itself will have to depend a lot on Russian vaccines. You know that, huh? So the availability and the accessibility of a COVID vaccine will mean a lot. I don't know if the candidates know about this. It can be turned and it can be crafted into a major election issue. The promise of a credible uh, vaccine. <clears throat> right. I think I think we have covered a lot of ground, and um, I, I'm assuming we have covered all the issues that are most central to the uh, elections this time in Myanmar. And I I really must thank you for patiently laying out everything, and also not just that, also speaking your mind uh, on the issues. Um, thank I'm you. sure. I'm sure. Thank you for giving me. I'm sure the viewers here and our audiences um, uh, would gain a lot of insights from this um, because it's literally a major election uh, next door. So thank you so much, Win. Uh, thank you for joining me in this conversation. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, and doing this for us. Thank you.